Good evening. My name is Jim Walker. I'm the pastor of Revival from Down Under in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. Tonight we're going to continue with the end time teachings. Tonight is part nine. And tonight I'm going to speak on the coming Antichrist. The coming Antichrist. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 15 we are told study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. This studying I believe must be done from all scripture because of what the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, where it says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, te that is teaching, for reproof, that is evidence of, for correction and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, Without the studying of all scripture, it really is impossible to get it right who the Antichrist is. And this is why over the years, many have been guessing, because it's not, certainly not scriptural, many have been guessing and saying the Antichrist is the Pope, the Antichrist at one time was Henry Kissinger. There's all been all kinds of people that, that have said the Antichrist is going to be. But what we need to do is study the Word because the Word tells us who He is, where He comes from, and roughly the timing of His coming. And so we need to study. <coughs> when we study we find a very important thing. Scripturally, we find that the Lord is a, a God of order and pattern. He is a God of order and a God of pattern. And if we studied the tabernacle of Moses, you would find that the tabernacle of Moses in the book of Exodus 25 and through Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you would find that the tabernacle of Moses had to be made according to the pattern showed to Abraham by God. And everything that was made had to be set in order. So he is a God of pattern and he is a God of order. And these patterns and orders of God where they have began in the Old Testament, they continue through into the New, because they do not change. They do not change. Hallelujah. When we read about Jesus in the Gospels, we find that Jesus chose a all the followers that he had, which he called disciples, we find that he chose 12 and called them apostles. He chose 12 and he called them apostles. And as we study the 12s in Scripture, we find a pattern is established that one of twelve always falls. One of twelve always falls. And these are not from, these are, these are ones that have been chosen by God to fulfill the pattern. And you'll find that they're always the ones that are, 
the one that falls is, is always one that's been close to God. Always one that has been close to God. Not somebody that is, you know, just coming up from somewhere. When we look at Jesus' 12 disciples, we find that one of them, Judas Iscariot, fell. And so if we turn into John and chapter 17, John chapter 17. Jesus said, Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that you gave me I have kept, and, and none of them is lost. <coughs> none of them is lost. But the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. That the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, when we study the scripture, Matthew 5, verse 17, Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but I have come to fulfill them. And we also find many times that Jesus said, this was done that the, what was said in whatever prophet or whatever might be fulfilled. Many, many times. Jesus said it, that it might be fulfilled. Even Paul said it occasionally, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. If we go over into John chapter 13, here, uh, at the Supper at the the supper in, in chapter thirteen verse four we find in verse in verse twenty six Jesus answered and he said He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And after the sop, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas, Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Satan entered into him. In another scripture, he said, Have I not called you twelve, and one of you is a devil? I've called you twelve, and one of you is a devil. But he knew, he knew who he was calling, because those he called were called, he called twelve to fulfill scripture, knowing that one of them would betray him. He knew that Judas would betray him before he chose him, because it's prophesied of that in the Old Testament. Hallelujah. In fact, if you turn to Psalm 109, Psalm 109, and in verse 8, speaking of Judas, he said, Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Now, again, when we study Scripture as we're supposed to do, we find that this, somebody taking his office, we find that that is fulfilled in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1,
Verse 24, they prayed and they said, Thou, Lord, which knows the hearts of all men, show whether of these two that you have chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. So here we see another taking the office of Judas. And we know that Matthias was chosen. Uh, the lot, it says in verse 26, they gave forth the lot and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was then numbered with the twelve. So Matthias replaced Judas. All right? When, as we study this, we will find in the time of the end, one of twelve will fall, but he will be replaced. He will be, as Judas was replaced, he also will be replaced by another apostle. Glory to God. This pattern of 12 didn't uh, begin with Judas choosing 12. It actually began back in the Old Testament. And we're going to read the scripture now, but it didn't even begin with them because it began with Satan. When we study it, we'll have a look in a minute. It actually began with Satan in the heavens. But I want to go to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49. Here in Genesis 49, um, Jacob begins to prophesy over his 12 sons. Is that, is that a coincidence that, that Jacob had 12 sons? Definitely not. Because these 12 sons actually foreshadow and, and they are the pattern and order of the 12s of Scripture. Hallelujah. So he says in verse 3 of Reuben, Reuben, thou art, thou art my firstborn. The firstborn in Scripture was the blessed son. He received headship, being the firstborn, and he received the promises. But because, because of what he did, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power, unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel, because you went up and you, to your father's bed and you defiled it. You went up to my couch. We know if we studied that, that Reuben actually slept with one of Jacob's concubines and defiled Jacob's bed. So he wasn't going to excel. And so Reuben lost his headship and he lost his blessing, the double portion blessing. These were transferred to Joseph. And if you go back a chapter, you find that Manasseh and Ephraim, they, took, they actually come in as tribes of Israel. When you study who went into the promised land, Ephraim and Manasseh were two of the tribes. So the, what was upon Reuben has now been shared between Joseph's two sons. And you'll see that happen back in uh, 48, Jacob calls Joseph and his two sons to him and it was customary to put your right hand upon the eldest son and your left hand upon the youngest one. But what we find, as with Jacob, Jacob was the younger of the two sons, and Jacob got the blessing. It was transferred from Esau to Jacob. 
And the same applies here. What Jacob did, Jacob was actually blind. And what he did, he had the, he had the, the eldest <coughs> sitting at his right hand, and he had the younger sitting at his left hand, and this is what he did when he went to, he did that. And so here we see a, the cross. Through the cross, the anointing went to the younger, not to the older. So the, the right hand was laid on the younger one. And he got all the blessings. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, so Reuben, is, is, Reuben falls. One of twelve, Reuben falls. From these 12 sons, when we study, we also find there comes forth 12 tribes. 12 tribes. Now, when we continue in Genesis 49, we go down to verse 16, and he's speaking to Dan. And he says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that bites, bites the horse's heels so that his rider shall fall back. So here, Dan is likened to a serpent. Who's the serpent? Satan's the serpent, and he's lying to a serpent. And if you go into Revelation, if you go into Revelation 7, and you read Revelation 7, and you read from verse 3 through verse 8, you will find that Dan is missing. He has fallen. Dan is not there amongst the tribes. So here we've had Judas falling, foreshadowed by Reuben, and foreshadowed by the tribe of Dan. But as I said earlier, the pattern didn't begin there. It began in the heavenlies. And we need to understand Scripture so that we get this right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In Matthew 26, if we turn to Matthew 26... And in verse 53, Jesus said, in verse 53, Think thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled? that it must be. He's talking then that, you know, he's got to go to the cross because it's been prophesied of him that he's going to go to the cross. So if Jesus called the 12 legions of angels to stop him going to the cross, Scripture wouldn't be fulfilled. He said, he said more than 12 legions of angels. The reason he said more than 12 legions of angels is because from Adam up till Jesus speaking this, everyone who died in God is as an angel in heaven. So now, before the creation of Adam, there was 12 legions of angels. But since then, Every person that's died and gone to heaven, including Adam, is as an angel 
So now there's more than 12 legions of angels. That's why he said what he said. If we go into Matthew 22, and verse 29, Jesus said, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Many people err, not knowing the Scriptures correctly. Many pastors, even big pastors, big ministries, have erred concerning Scripture because they've not rightly divided it. <coughs> and God will show them if they've got a heart and ears to hear. He then says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So when they died, they didn't go down into hell. They went to heaven because Scripture said so. And so in heaven, they are as the angels of God. Amen? Now to prove this, that men become angels, can I prove this? I can prove it. Where can I prove it? Revelation. I prove it in Revelation. Because in Revelation chapter 16, it talks about seven angels pouring out the seven vials of the wrath of God. In Revelation 16, 1, 2, 3, and so on. All right? Now, when we go over... When we go over into Revelation 17, 1, we are clearly told, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me. John saying this, John said, one of the seven angels came and talk with me. And you'll find that through the rest of the chapters that this angel speaks to John and tells him things that are going to happen. Amen? If we go into Revelation 19, verse 9, and it, and it said, He said unto me, Who? Who said unto him? The angel said unto him. He said unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These, th these are the true sayings of God. <clears throat> and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, Don't do it. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus Christ, worship God. So here, this angel just tells him, I'm just a human being like you that was on the earth and has been saved and I'm now I'm, I'm just as an angel. Hallelujah. If we go over into Revelation 22, again, verse 22 it says, Verse 1, it says, And he showed me. Who showed me? The angel. He showed me a pure river of life. Amen? And then he goes down into um, verse 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard them and, and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then said he unto me, See you do it not, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets. So this guy was a prophet. A fellow servant of John and a prophet. And he's shown as an angel because they're all angels as angels in heaven. Amen? Glory to God. We need to understand that to help us rightly divide 
what I've just said about the 12 legions of angels and those angels that are after. Amen? The 12 legions of angels, they were created beings that you may think have wings, flapping angel, things like type, but they are the original creation before Adam was created. Glory to God. If we go over into Luke and chapter 10, See, if you didn't understand that Jacob had 12 sons and there was 12 tribes and, you know, you could never get this, t this teaching right. You could never get it right. Because you don't, you don't know the pattern, you can't follow the pattern, so you don't know what, where the Antichrist comes from at the end. Luke 10. In verse 18, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So Satan, the head, Satan was the head of one of the legions. It was the seed, you may call him a legionnaire because that's what a head of a legion is, a le Head of a legion is a legionnaire. So he was the head of one of the legions, one, of one of these 12 legions, and Jesus said, I saw him fall. When did he fall? When did Satan fall? He fell in Genesis 1, when darkness covered the deep. That's when he fell. Sometime before Adam was created. Jesus, being God, obviously saw him fall. Hallelujah. Amen. When we study the twelve of Scripture, which are foreshadowed by uh, the twelve sons of, uh, of Jacob, and the 12 tribes, etc., we also find that they are symbolized. They are also symbolized in Scripture. We have, we have Jesus' first 12 symbolized in Scripture, but we also have the 12 that are yet to come also symbolized in Scripture. And when we study the Word, we find in the Word... We are, we are shown two twelves together. We see it, we see it with the high priest and the, on his shoulder he had two stones with names the twelve tribes of Israel on them. He also had a breastplate with twelve names on here. Two twelves. When, when Joseph crossed, when Joshua crossed Jordan, there were two twelves of stones at the Jordan, symbolizing the two twelves. But when we go into 1 Kings 18, we clearly see there are two twelves. That's if you can count. I, I, you know, if you can't count, then you're not going to see it. You've got to be at least be able to count up to 12, or count up to four and be able to multiply. In 1 Kings 18, we see here Elijah going to restore true worship in Israel. And he does it by taking, verse 31, by taking 12 stones as the foundation of the altar is going to sacrifice the bullock on. The bullock represents Christ 
And the 12 stones symbolize Jesus' 12 apostles. Can you see that? Can you, can you read 12 stones? That's pretty clear, isn't it? There are how many stones? 12. When we go into verse 32, he says, Fill four barrels with water and pour on the burnt sacrifice and over the wood. How many? Four barrels full of water. He then said in verse 34, that's in verse 33, in verse 34 he said, do it a second time. So that's fill the four barrels again and pour them over the sacrifice. He then said, do it a third time. Fill the four barrels again and pour it over the sacrifice. So three fours is 12. These symbolize the second 12 that are yet to come. And we will see these second, this second 12 associated with the coming Elijah ministry. John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. But there is another ministry going to come. They are the fivefold ministry of Ephesians chapter 4 11. They are going to come with a word carrying a heavy rain that, and they will, they will just be prior to the second 12. So we have 12 stones and Elijah and 12 barrels of water. Hallelujah. Amen. 12 stones, Elijah, 12 barrels of water. If we go over into Matthew 13, sorry, Matthew 14, In verses 16 through 21, here we have Jesus feeding 5,000. Jesus feeding 5,000. And he fed the 5,000 from five loaves of bread. How many loaves of bread? Five. See, see what I did then? I, I went five. I used my hand. So you could see five. These five loaves symbolize the five ministries of Ephesians 4.11. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. They symbolize those five ministries. Now, the ones who broke the... Jesus broke the bread and gave it to his disciples to give out and they fed 5,000. 5,000 speaks of the church. This is a feeding of the church. Right? But amongst the disciples were the 12. So his 12 gave out the five, the bread from the five. And then it says they gathered in have a look. It says, verse 20, verse 20, they did all eat and were filled, and they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full of bread. 12 baskets full. So, 12 apostles, 5 loaves, 12 baskets. 12 stones, Elijah, 12 barrels. It's the same picture. It's the same revelation. It's the same understanding. Amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. If 
we go over into Revelation chapter 4, it speaks of 24 elders. Verse 4, round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders. Twenty-four is two twelves. Twenty-four is two twelves. These twenty-four elders are twenty-four apostles. Not as some think, elders of Israel, Old Testament, and preach it, these are, you've got, this is Revelation. These are 24 apostles, the first 12 and the second 12. Now, when we study the word as we're supposed to do, guess what Peter called himself? Yes. Guess what John called himself? Let's read it and then you know as much as I do. You'll be as clever as me. In 2 John, 2 John, the Apostle John, starts off the, the chapter with the elder unto the elect lady. So here John calls himself an, an elder. John calls himself an elder. One of the 24. Hallelujah. If you go into 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter 5, verse 1, the elder, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an Elder. So here we have Peter calling himself an elder, and we have the Apostle John call himself an elder, and they were both apostles. Hallelujah. Amen. 24 elders, two twelves. These 12 are symbol, the second 12 apostles are symbolized in Revelation 12 1 by 12 stars around the head of the woman. This woman, when studied correctly, is the bride or the wife of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So here these 12 stars symbolize the 12 that are yet to come. They are also symbolized in Revelation 21, in Revelation 21, they are also symbolized by verse 12. And he had a wall, it had a wall great and high. It had 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. These 12 angels, an angel is a ministry, an angel is a messenger, can speak of a pastor, etc. And these 12 angels represent the second 12 apostles of Jesus Christ, the 12 that are yet to come. <clears throat> Hallelujah. As we continue to study the Antichrist, we will find 
that he also is symbolized and foreshadowed by many things. He's foreshadowed by Reuben, foreshadowing of him by Satan falling. He is foreshadowed by the tribe of Dan falling. He is foreshadowed by Judas Iscariot falling. And Jesus said in John 17, I have lost none, only the son of perdition. So Judas was called the son of perdition, one of twelve who fell. One of twelve who fell. He is also he is also symbolized as the tail of the dragon in Revelation chapter 12, which we'll look at shortly. He is also symbolized as the eighth in Revelation 17, the one who is the eighth and goes into perdition. He is the false prophet of Revelation 19, verse 20. And he, he is the son of perdition of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. Hallelujah. He is also symbolized as a beast, an angel, and a fallen star. Because there has to be a fallen star. If the pattern is correct, one of the 12 stars around the head of the woman must fall to fulfill the pattern that we have had a look at from Satan all the way through. And so when we study, when we study and we go into Revelation 8, we find a great star falls from heaven. Revelation 8, verse 10 and 11 and it occurs at the sounding of the trumpet by the third angel. The third, uh, third fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. A lamp, a burning lamp speaks of the word of God. Thy, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Psalm 119 verse 105. And it fell... This burning star fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Hallelujah. A third part of the rivers and fountains of waters. These rivers and waters speak of Christians. He is going to deceive a third of all Christians. Why? We'll read it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Shortly, why they get deceived. Hallelujah. Scripture said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of your belly. And a third, with the belly full of living water, fall. That's not a good sign, is it? Hallelujah. When we go into Revelation 9 and verse 1, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven. This is correctly translated, a star having already fallen. Because he fell in verse, back in, in, in chapter 8, he fell. All right? So, having already fallen, now this is the important part. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So we need to, 
The fallen star is given the key to the bottomless pit. This is very important for when you read Revelation 17. If we go into verse 11 of chapter 9, it says, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Now he is an, an angel. He's gone from being a star to an angel, having the key of the bottomless pit. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If we go into Revelation 11, we find he, we find he kills the two witnesses. And the two witnesses, they are ministering to natural Israel during the last 42 months before Jesus comes back. The same 42 months that the two beats of Revelation 13 rule, these two witnesses are witnessing in Jerusalem to the natural Jew. And it says in verse 7, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that are sent out of the bottomless pit now is a beast. He was a star, then an angel, and now he's a beast. And he has the key of the bottomless pit. Amen. If you go to Revelation 17, Revelation 17, and verse 11, and he said, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, he is of the seven, and he goes into perdition. So we see this beast linked with perdition. He goes into perdition. Hallelujah. John the Judas Iscariot was the son of perdition. Glory to God. If we go back into verse 8, it says of this beast, the beast that you saw, that was and is not, that's what it said in verse 11, the beast that you saw that was and is not, he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So that's pretty clear, isn't it? So this guy is the fallen star. Because the fallen star comes out of the bottomless pit and is given the keys to the bottomless pit. Hallelujah. And he will go into perdition. Why does he go into perdition? Because he is the son of perdition. Of 2 Thessalonians 2. Hallelujah. He is also, I said, symbolized by the tail of the dragon. And so if we go into Revelation 12, do we need to know all this? It's very important that you know all this so you get it right. Because if you don't understand this, you can't, you're going to wrongly divide Scripture. You'll say all kinds of things that have been said over the last 2,000 years about the Antichrist. Revelation 12, verse 4, verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Now, when you read further down, this great red dragon is Satan. Verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. So here we have Satan, seven heads and ten arms, and the tail joined as one body. Joined as one. Because they are one. The heads, the tail, and the body being Satan. Hallelujah. So who is the tail of the dragon? 
Well, again, you've got to study. And you've got to go back into Isaiah chapter 9, and it tells you who the tale of the dragon is. Isaiah 9, and verse 15 says, The ancient and honorable, that is God the Father, he is the head, and the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. The prophet that teaches lies, speaking of the false prophet, is false. Why is he false? Because he teaches lies. The false prophet of Revelation 19, verse 20 is the tale of the dragon. So the tale of the dragon is the false prophet, and the false prophet, we find, is the second beast of Revelation chapter 13, because they both do the same things. They both do the same things. Hallelujah. If we go into 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says in verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together unto him. Now we've just, in the, in the chapter prior, verse 7 through 10, it tells how God is going to, how Jesus is going to come back in flaming fire. The return of Christ is going to be in flaming fire. So it's talking about the same coming. It's the same coming of Jesus in flaming fire. That you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. As that, that the day of Christ is at hand. Paul's telling us 2,000 years ago, the day of Christ is at hand. Well, it is now. It is now. He then says, let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. When you study Matthew 24, that's what Jesus talks about concerning a second coming. His disciples said to him in verse 3, when shall your, what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And he, starts, and he starts off in verse 4 by saying, let no man deceive you. Let no one deceive you. And he talks about many deceivers coming prior to Jesus' return. And this, this one is the biggest deceiver of the lot. Let no man deceive you by any means, the only way you are not going to be deceived is by knowing the word. The only way that you'll not be deceived is by rightly dividing the word of truth. That day, that day, the day of the Lord, shall not come except there be first a falling away. That falling away being the deception of the stars being cast to the ground. Revelation 12, a third of the stars being cast to the ground. Revelation 8, a third of the waters being deceived. <clears throat> and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, the man of sin being the coming Antichrist. 
he cannot be revealed until his time. And his time will be before Jesus comes back. His time will be before Jesus comes back. If we carry on, it's called the son of perdition. Judas Iscariot was called the son of perdition. Here, this guy is called the son of perdition. Let's see what it says of him. He, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, so that he, he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. What is the temple of God? The church is the temple of God. He's going to be sitting in some churches telling them he's God. And he'll he'll be proving himself to be God by doing miracles. By doing miracles. Because that's what he does in Revelation 13, verse 11 onwards. He does miracles. He does miracles to deceive. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholds, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work, and he who now lets will let, I believe that's speaking of the Holy Spirit, because he's at the moment, he's stopping everything from happening, until he, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way. At the beginning of the last 42 months, when the Antichrist has sole rule, the woman of Revelation 12 is taken out of the way into the wilderness. By eagle wing power, the Holy Spirit goes with her. So when he is taken out with the woman, it then says, then shall the wicked one be revealed. That is at the beginning of the last 42 months. Because the woman goes into the wilderness for 1260 days, and 1260 days is three and a half years, And three and a half years is 42 months. The same period of time as the two witnesses and the same period of time given to the two beasts of Revelation 13. Hallelujah. Let's continue to read. Then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Revelation 19. And it's verse, and you can read, it it destroys him in Revelation 19, verse 20, by taking him and casting him into the lake of fire. Even him whose coming is after the work of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. If you read Revelation 13, verse 11 to the end, that's what the second beast does. He does signs and lying wonders to deceive all those upon the earth, to receive the mark of the beast. Hallelujah. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, Because they receive not, they receive not a love for the truth. What's a love for the truth? My word is truth. Are you glad you prayed for that the other night? Because if you don't have a love for the truth, you will be deceived. You will be deceived because it said so. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, and for this cause, because they did not receive 
a love for the truth, for this cause, God sends them a strong delusion that they believe the lie. The lie being the Antichrist in the temple of God, doing lying signs and lying wonders. And because they don't know the truth, they believe the lie. If they knew the truth, they would know it was a lie. And there were false signs and wonders. For this cause, God should send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What is unrighteousness? Sin. Unrighteousness is sin. Unrighteousness is the works of the flesh of which Paul says, any man doing such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Because they are unrighteous works, they are not godly works. Hallelujah. When we read <coughs> the letters of John, <coughs> we find that Antichrist is a spirit and a person. It is a spirit that is in effect today. Antichrist, you see it in effect to in, in them that believe not that Jesus is the Son of God. That is the spirit of Antichrist. People do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It is the spirit of Antichrist working in them. Let's have a look in John. <clears throat> in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come. So here he is. Antichrist shall come. But we know there are already being those that are Antichrist. But the Antichrist is yet to come. Amen? <clears throat> and in 1 John 4, 1 John 4 and verse 3, every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Hallelujah. So anybody that refuses to believe that Jesus is the Son of God is affected by a spirit of Antichrist. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we read Revelation 13, the Antichrist is the second beast of Revelation 13, verse 11 onwards. He is the Antichrist. He is the son of perdition. He is a fallen apostle, the fallen star, the son of perdition. He is all these things. He is the coming Antichrist. The first beast, of Revelation 13, he is also Antichrist. He is not the Antichrist, but he is affected by the spirit of Antichrist. He is not only Antichrist, he will be anti all religions because he tries to set himself up as the one to be worshipped in the last 42 months. He's anti-God, he's anti-every God. But there is only one true Antichrist. The beast of Revelation 13, I will speak on next week. We will do them two separate 
weeks so you don't get confused. Is that okay? Amen? So next week, the, I don't know, I can't remember what I've called it, but the first beast of Revelation 13 and who he is. He is actually a last world dictator. He is the last world dictator this world is ever going to see. He rules all the world. And we will see that when we study him next week. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you.